Welcome to the Rocks Cry Out. I'm Indiana Joe, and today we've come to the top of Norfolk to Hanstanton. And we've come here to ask ourselves a few questions. You see, in the cliffs behind me, there are many fossils. And some of the questions we will be asking are, how did these fossils form? How long did they take to form? Did they form really slowly, or did they form really quickly? And how did these cliffs get here in the first place? And how long did they take to form? Just some of the questions we will be asking amongst many others. So come and join me today as we discover the truth. So a good place to start is what do you actually find here? Because as you may have noticed, there are three different rock types. Let's start with this brown rock at the bottom. This is a type of sandstone called carstone. And you can see it's very loose, it's very crumbly, it breaks up really easily in my hand. In fact, that's basically what a sandstone is. Stone means hard, and sand refers to the size of particles that make up that hard thing. So it's lots of little bits of sediment that have become glued together with iron in order to turn into something hard, a sandstone. So the car stone has been dated to 109 million years old. Now I reject those dates and you'll find out why later, but for now bear them in mind because we're going to come back and we're going to ask how long did it take for these cliffs to form? And does it make sense for how long they supposedly formed? But let's move up to the next formation up here. And you can see it's this lovely deep red chalk. We've moved from sandstone into limestone, the chalk, the Hunstanton formation. And the red colour, this deep red colour that you can see, that comes from iron. There's lots of iron in here and the iron has tarnished it to this red colour. It's basically rusty. Now there are quite a lot of fossils in the Hunstanton formation and we'll come back to those later, but there are plenty more fossils in the Ferriby chalk formation, this grey chalk above it. In fact, it's crammed full of it. Now the Ferriby formation has been dated to 99 million years. Again, I disagree with the dating, but bear it in mind, we're going to come back to that later. But for now, let's forget about dates and let's have a look at what is actually inside the cliffs. What fossils do you find in both the Hunstanton and the Ferriby chalk formation? Let's go and explore and find out more. Here we go. So I'm going to introduce you to the world of paleobiology. This is a study of how fossils from the past used to live when they were living creatures. And it's really very difficult to do because it's hard to build a picture of how these creatures lived when the one thing you know about these fossils is that they're all currently dead. That's the, the one thing that you know. It seems obvious, but it's very important to recognise. Now have a look at this fossil brachiopod that we've just dug out of the cliff here. It's got beautiful detail all over it. You can even still see the hole where the siphon would have attached it to the sea floor. But the one th interesting thing about these brachiopods is that they're all found buried upside down. They're all in this position along the cliff and I've collected hundreds along here at Hunstanton. But when they were alive, they would have been turned that way, attached to the sea floor. So they are not in the position that they were living in. They've been ripped up, mixed along, tumbled along, buried with all the sediment, positioned upside down. These brachiopods have been transported along. They're not in the position that they were living in. So are there any other fossils here that show evidence of transportation? What else can you find here at Hunstanton? Let's go and find out. So look what we found, we've just excavated this out of the rocks and you can see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six belemnite fossils in this rock. Now what are belemnites? Well, I've got a little model down here. So this is a larger belemnite from just around the corner at Cromer and uh, this is the model. You can see it's got tentacles at the front, it's got this little blower, it's a sort of a pointy shaped creature and it blows itself along in this direction. Now, the belemnite fossil you find is the only hard part out of the belemnite and it fits at the back end like this and that is what you find. That's what we're looking at down here. But can you notice all of these 
little belemnite fossils are all pointing in roughly the same direction, from left to right. The pointy bit's all this side, the flat bit is all this side. They've all been moving along in one direction. Now this means a couple of things. First of all, these belemnites did not die how they were living. They've been swept into position, they've been transported, moved from one place to another. They've been mixed in with all of the sediment, they've been dumped down really quickly, all pointing in the same direction from left to right. These belemnites were buried quickly amongst all the other sediment. But what about the other fossils? Are there any other fossils here that show evidence of them being buried really quickly like these belemnites? So down here we've got a much larger ammonite fossil imprint. Down here we've got a nice imprint of a fossil nautilus and up here we've got a very faint imprint of another ammonite. So these are obviously much larger fossils. And fossilization itself is quite an interesting topic. You see, in order to get a fossil, you need to bury your creature quickly, you need to bury your creature deeply, and you need to bury your creature without the presence of oxygen. If you don't have those three things in place, you will never ever get a fossil. Your creature will simply be destroyed, disintegrated and fall apart long before you have a chance to turn it into a fossil. It needs to be buried quickly, deeply and without oxygen, which is what needed to happen with these fossils here, particularly the larger ones. The larger they are, the quicker and the deeper you needed to be buried. And that also means that the rock that these fossils are in also had to be buried and formed really, really quickly as well. Otherwise, you'd never get a chance to catch up your creature and turn it into a fossil. But do you remember the dates that I mentioned earlier? How do those dates match up with the rate of formation in the cliffs here? And how does that rate of formation match up with how we know these fossils had to be formed quickly? <laughs> So let's answer that question, how long did it take these cliffs to form, according to the dates? Now, can you remember what I said the supposed date at the bottom of the cliff, the Carstone was? 109 million years. And the supposed date for the Ferriby formation? 99 million years. Now what do you get if you take 99 off of 109? The answer, 10. So according to the secular evolutionary dates, it took a supposed 10 million years to lay down these cliffs. And the height of the cliffs at the highest point is about 20 metres. In other words, it took 10 million years to lay down 20 metres of sediment. And now the real math comes in. So let's put this all into context. What do those dates actually mean? 10 million years to lay down 20 metres of sediment. 20 metres is the same as 20,000 millimetres. So it took 10 million years of supposed time to lay down 20,000 millimetres. Now, if you take 20,000, which is the height of the cliffs in millimetres, and divide it by 10 million, which is the supposed time it took for these cliffs to lay down, you get the figure 0.002. Now, what does that mean? Well, that's 0.002 millimetres that was being laid down every year going on the dates that have been assigned to this rock. That's hardly anything. I mean, you can't even put your fingers that close together. And it's particularly ridiculous when you consider the fossils that we find here, like this brachiopod that we dug out earlier. Now, how long would it take to just cover this brachiopod if the rate of formation was real? The answer is, 18,700 years. Now, if you think that's ridiculous, that's because it simply is. You would never be able to bury it. Uh, you'd never be able to get a fossil. It would be completely destroyed long before you had a chance to turn it into a fossil. It wouldn't hang around for that length of time. It would completely disintegrate. And that leads me on to a very important point. And if you've been watching these videos before, you'll know exactly what I'm gonna say, but it's still extremely important. Fossilization has got nothing to do with time, but everything to do with a process. Get the process right, it happens very quickly. So what have we learnt here at Hans Stanton? Well, quite a lot really. We've learned about all the fossils you can find along here. We've learned about paleobiology, the study of how these fossils used to live and how difficult it is to work out how they used to live, purely because the fossil record is a record of death, not of life. All the fossils you find are now dead, so it's really hard to build up a picture of how they used to live in the past. 
we've learned how all the fossils here are not in the same position that they were alive in. They've been tipped upside down, twisted and moved, moved into the same position so they're all pointing the same way by currents. These creatures did not live, die and get buried in the same place, but instead have been transported here by those same currents, moving them into position so they're now all pointing the same direction. We've learnt about the dates and how they simply do not work, particularly when you consider the rate of formation that is based on those dates. If those dates were real, you would not get a single fossil here at Hanstanton, and yet the cliffs are absolutely crammed full of them, millions of them going all the way down. It doesn't make sense, something doesn't add up. What we need is a new interpretation, a new way of looking at the evidence. But there's one more piece to the puzzle. You see, Hanstanton is quite famous for its chalk, and then so is Norfolk. The chalk goes down over a thousand foot in some places. But it's the whole UK as well. Think of the White Cliffs of Dover, or the big white chalk cliffs down on the Isle of Wight. But it's not just the UK. To the east of the UK, you have got Normandy, chalk running through Europe, through Asia, all the way down to the west coast of Australia. To the west of the UK, it goes through Wales into Ireland, across to the US, and then down into South America. The chalk covers a huge amount of the planet's surface, and it's all provably the same chalk, because it all sits on the same bed of sandstone, just like here at Hunstanton. All provably the same sandstone, all provably the same chalk, all provably the same fossils, all provably laid down very, very quickly. This is starting to sound a lot like a worldwide flood. In fact, a worldwide flood like the one described in Genesis, Noah's flood, makes much more sense of the evidence. A worldwide marine deposit that's been laid down by huge rushing waters moving in the same direction. A worldwide flood calling a worldwide water-led deposit. It makes much more sense of the evidence. Now, if you've enjoyed visiting Hanstanton with me today, make sure to get the accompanying booklet to this presentation so you too can visit Hanstanton and do your own research, find your own fossils. The book goes into much more detail, including some of the research I've done here on the Bellamnites. They're more pointing the same way. If you enjoy this in general, make sure to check out the rest of the Rocks Cry Out series, where you can visit locations around the UK to be able to do your own research there as well. Go to www.therockscryout.co.uk to find out more. If you want to find out more about me and the work that I do with creation research, go to www.creationresearch.net, where you will find lots more information about the work that I do. Until next time, I'm Indiana Joe. Goodbye, God bless, and I will see you very soon. Happy hunting!